Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, Kiro Malali is my name. Uh, this is our third Technical Tuesday of 2020. Uh, we have with us today Michael Crispin uh, joining us from Thailand. I'm not exactly sure where it's Thailand, right, Michael? <laughs> it's um, between Pattaya and Rayong, so very, very good. Each town's roughly half an hour away. Fantastic. And he's going to be giving us uh, the Technical Tuesday talk on the original title, I think, was Automation, the Most Common Design Issues. Um, but there's, there's a number of different areas Mike is, well, Michael is going to delve into. Um, uh, he's got quite a lot of experience in this area. I'd say, and I, and I haven't seen Michael or heard Michael's talk yet, but just as a kind of a warning to, to everyone, as usual, I'm sure there's people with a a mixed background. Um, some people would be maybe very familiar with some of the automation concepts that Michael is going to talk about today, and some of you will not be as familiar. I think the great thing about this format that we're doing, you know, obviously because of COVID-19, is that, you know, this is not just a one-off event. Hugh is, is recording this now tonight, as, as always. So this talk will be an asset that you'll have you know, for the next couple of months or, or years or whatever it is. So as your own knowledge uh, in, in automation uh, increases, if, if, if that's the kind of the, the way your career goes, you can go back to this lecture and, and probably every time you go back to it, you'll maybe get a little bit more out of it. So if initially it's a little bit over your head, you know, stick with it. And um, I'm sure you'll get a lot out of it by the end and on, on further revisions of it. So uh, without further ado, Michael, please take it away. Oh, yeah. and um, we'll have, so I, I suppose, Michael, you'll probably be talking for maybe 45 minutes or, or maybe a bit more, uh, whatever it is. And then afterwards, we'll have uh, some questions and answers as per usual. So that's the format as usual. Michael, please uh, take it away. Yeah. OK, thank you, Kieran. Um, as you can see, there are three different chapters, and I promise you, I don't go too deep in technical things. Um, it is more an, an overview of what we have, and uh, I plan to do some specific lectures for only one chapter, and that will be a bit more in detail for, the, um, for those people who are more interested in that. So just... Let us um, uh, let me introduce first myself. I worked about uh, 25 years for Amazon in Germany, and so my my main experience is of course with Amazon Delta V. But I have also seen other systems and also PLC, so I can talk about both worlds. Um, let us go first with. Uh, chapter PLC and DCS definition. So, and before we dig into that, I would like to show you some old style control rooms. Most of you will not know this. Um, when I started in the 80s with detail design, electrical detail design, I had to plan such control walls <laughs> and um, it's, even in some older power station or so, you still have something like that. So it is not always usually that you see only PCs and monitors and uh, have a nice room. That this was how it was in the 80s and before. And at this time, we also didn't have any electronical, just relay technique logic and so on, and um, system cabinets look like this here. And then in the 80s, it started that PLC were on the market and even DCS system also take over to control any kind of plant. So what you can see is here, that is an um, the control room, how it looked before, with typical alarm tableaus, some uh, controller or even recorder or something like that, and 
on the top, maybe you cannot see really good, but there is mostly uh, the workflow schema like the PID and it has some, sometimes also some mini bulbs inside to sign for alarm as well. And that is what we, I think, know or everybody know from today. So again, in the very early time of process control, we hadn't any electronic or so. I mean, I speak now about the 30s, 1930 and up, when chemical industry start some kind of automation and they could do only with pneumatic because of um, that was the only safe way to control anything in a chemical plant where the risk for explosion or so was high. So that means they had really long pipes, copper pipes or whatever, so for one or two millimeter diameter from the field sensor until the control room and then to the, uh, the equipment for whatever they should do. Later, so in, in the 50s, 60s about, start the electronic, then we got transistor and uh, the, the logic become easier to make an AND or 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 something like this for whatever control we need. But mostly that was even done with relay technique, but electric. So then with the more and more progress of electronic development, we got specific electronic logic on PCB based and uh, so that could substitute the hardware relay. But that means every end or, or whatever logic function you have to soldier pin by pin and that was a horrible work to, to develop and also to build up in the cabinets. So there was the run to make it easier and that was the point to get a PLC, a programmer logic controller. And this of course now uh, turned the process control and make a big revolution. We have only a few hardwired logic until now, but mainly even the safety PLC now um, take over for such kind of logic. So uh, the technique make more and more progress. And since the first programmer controller came up in the 80s, they did only control for some specific devices or just simple equipments. And maybe had an, a cabinet with some buttons and lamps for alarm. That was the, the, the standard control. That is even normal also for smaller machines to have it today. So not every system has a monitor. So, uh, but I will explain later in a second chapter for this. But plants become bigger and the wish for a whole control of the plant comes up and therefore they decide or they, they developed a better structure and overhead over PLCs and that come to the DCS now, distributed control system. So uh, a PLC Normally, the main purpose was and even is to use it for fast processes because the PLC can run very fast. We talk about cycle times in milliseconds, so maybe 20 to 50 milliseconds or so, while the DCS is much slower. So there we talk about cycles from one second plus. As a low-cost controller, without any diagnostic, without any trending and so on, no HMI, it is very cheap. And I just want to show you some um, that you see. 
the tone must be always a Siemens PLC. <laughs> this is a, a Vago PLC controller and it can connect also some IOs and that is used very often for chip electronic or for chip control and so on, but also for other standard um, plant process control. Maybe not for such big ones, but there are still different sizes of plants. So when we talk about a pharmacy or a chemical plant, everybody think about big refinery or whatever. But there are also smaller plants where I even work for um, like rubber plants. So the, the process is very simple. You have some IOs, you have some control valves, some temperature measurements, and that's, that's it. And that is fine to get controlled by such a small controller. And it is even much, much cheaper than the whole big system of a PLC or TCS system. Um, the disadvantage is that this PLCs must, con uh, must program everything by hand, or not by hand, but your, your basic functionality. You have to program individual what you need. This is a view of, of one program that called Codesys, that is a platform to control the kind of controller, what I, the PLC, what I showed you, this Vago. But I even can use this to program so that nice thing here. Maybe some people know this. That's a Raspberry Pi. That is uh, this above are some relays only, but the lower one is a complete PC. So it has, as you can see, USB connectors and uh, network and also monitor. And I use this. <laughs> for my hobby here, my house automation. And the program is um, also written on this codices. So that's very cheap. You talk about $100 about of total cost. This program is free, but the Raspberry Pi and some IOs is, that is the, the, the cheapest PLC you can get. But I have to, I have to program everything what I need later make my own function blocks and uh, until I came to the point that I get something general, what we also know from uh, DCS. So these are different views. Yeah. So in principle, that is an, a basic function. This is a digital input. And we have other like analog inputs, analog outputs, PID controller. And this function blocks are normally used in a DCS. So that make it very easy to put in an uh, IO channel, do some basic configurations and get signals for your alarm or whatever you need. So that is what I mean with basic functionality. So you have to go and build up your own function blocks, which you can use then later for your process signals and the sensor and actor. A DCS, so-called distributed control system, you can also, of course, program. But the purpose of a DCS is a higher control system which lead the PLCs as a sub-level. But a PLC, remember, is normally only to control some specific equipment, but a DCS, the whole system, will control the whole plant. So it brings that all together. It can therefore contain several PLCs or Depends on, so for Siemens, for example, is uh, they have their PLCs underlaying in their PCS7 system. And uh, like Emerson, they have proprietary logic controllers, so own controller. They, they work only with this system. 
but a DCS have much more functionality from the background. So it have an integrated HMI. HMI means human machine interface. So the graphic displays and a operator, um, and yeah, the operator graphic, uh, they see what happened in the process. It have alarm list and uh, alarm support, even access security so that not everybody can do everything on any parameter or on every equipment. We can have trend, that means historical data. We get diagnostic to see the, the health of this um, DCS. Not only the controller, also um, up or down to the sensors and actors but that we will see later also at I.O. And finally, of course, is the highest hierarchy, the recipe control, the batch control. Well, batch control also should not think that is used only in pharmacy. We have also in normal chemical plants batch controls. Even in a continuous running plant, we can have a batch control, at least for maybe start up or for shutdown or any other. So batch is not only pharmacy. And the main thing is that this basic functionality, so what I showed you just before, and it's the I function block or AI function block, they are already integrated in such systems. And they are meanwhile also standardized by, I forgot the number, this some EIC 613, I don't know, but it's just a number, no need to remember. So let us look how such typical system look like. Here this side shows a, a Siemens field scene, and this is the controller, and these are I.O. cards where we can connect sensors and actors. So this is, a, I don't know what for transmitter, and then this maybe is the valve or motor. And they can have some um, panel connected even with graphical outputs. On the left side, we see a DCS system where you can see that this is maybe a PLC or a dedicated controller from, from another manufacturer. So Delta V from Amazon have their own controller. But in principle, you can connect also IOs to that controllers. They have IO cards. And then they have a network where they are all connected and you get also the information from the, uh, from the process in your graphic displays. So, but meanwhile, it is the, the development, the progress of these um, control systems is very fast and they, they develop newer things and the, the traditional difference between a PLC and a um, DCS become less and less. So PLC can be also a an, an DCS and DCS can get controllers which are very fast and can do some PLC functionality. So it depends just on the on the execution time for the um, for the cycle time. So how often we, we ask sensors and actors and can we do this in, in milliseconds or can we do this in seconds like a normal DCS? So of course, um, if you want to use PLCs like Siemens and you want to get the DCS functionality of this, then you have to add many additional programs. And that is how Siemens can make from a PLC a PCS. They have for the graphic output, WinCC or WonderWare, and that can also trend or they have some, some um, own developed basic functionalities, but that you have to buy always. So no? the, the big advantage of the low cost for a PLC disappear meanwhile, when you have to buy all the other points 
to get a DCS. And that's why a DCS is in principle always a bit more expensive than a PLC. So you have to think for everything for what or what you want to do with your control. If you want to do only small process or even a machine, but even with some HMI, you should better go for a PLC. But if you have a, a bit bigger plan, then you should go for a DCS. That uh, you have a lot of advantages if you use a DCS in principle. Then there are some other um, main differences. A PLC program, that what I showed you, is normally a serial execution. So that means you define your, your program blocks and they will be executed as fast as possible. And if you have more code, then they take a bit longer. But once it is finished, it starts from the beginning. A DCS works a bit different. Every basic functionality is set on a specific task. So you can set that a DI input um, should get a new value every, let's say, one second or every 10 seconds, depends on. For analog inputs like temperature, you might go for, for five seconds because temperature normally don't change so much. Or if you have a 100 cubic meter tank, then also your level will not change drastically in one second. So this, you can reduce a bit the CPU load so that you can put in some more code in a DCS controller. Because of the background functionality, what this controller do, um, they have to, they are very easy to overload so that the controller yeah, cannot really execute in that time. And therefore, you should look what is the advantage for, for both worlds, for what you need is. Um, and I have seen, for example, that in some projects, they, they had an older plan which was done on PLC level, and then they wanted to change to a DCS. So then in that case, of course, the Delta V system, but the, the logic and everything else should be handled in the same way like before. So then the customer don't want it to change too much. He was afraid that his plan will not run again. But this make a big problem for a DCS if it should work like a PLC, because of even the execution is different. You cannot predict at which time a sensor is executed. We can say every second, but not the order. We cannot predict, uh, let's say, for a control loop where we have an analog input and PID controller block and an analog output that they are always executed in this order. They can be also execute in analog input, analog output, PID, which take then one more cycle. Uh, and uh, if you, yeah, for a PLC it doesn't matter, but for a DCS it can um, extend the, the signal running time through the system if you don't take care for this. So you can avoid if you put all the functionalities into one module and let it run all together in one second. So then it will not make any problem. And uh, Safety logic, so that in former time, that was always also made in hardwire system. But the electronic and safety or the stability of such controller become better and better that you can use also a PLC up to CL3. CL3 is a safety integration level, it's the highest which we have. I mean, we, we can use it even for, for a nuclear power plant and so on. But uh, a PLC, a uh, safety PLC, is not like a normal PLC. So these are some typical um, programming 
where we came from. When you remember, in the beginning, we had always three legs. And this, they start to develop a programming with the early PLCs in these structures. So each of these symbol um, indicate just a contact. So this is an, a contact which, when it is active, it close, and this, when it is active, it open. So, and then you see if everything is on, then your actor will start. So this is a, a target, what you want to control. And this is another one, and that is what uh, most of the Siemens programmer like to do. They, they work in assembler. So that is a very specific thing, but meanwhile, it doesn't matter if you use assembler or function blocks. The execution time is not faster to do this, but if you program, you can do much more failures. So this maybe you have to program a function block, but you have an already made function block already, then you should better use this one. So function block is like this here. So this is an end and or some, uh, I cannot read what is that. Uh, this is a flip-flop, something like this. So this is a, now a more modern style of programming. So we use ready-made function blocks and connect them, where we, also, meanwhile, go away to talk about programming that is more a configuration. So we use ready things and just connect them. So that uh, goes a bit away from the typical programmer. And this is an away, this uh, continuous function chart where you don't see, like here, these networks or like here, this, uh, the lines. Oops. This is a block and you, you can add even much more blocks on, on a bigger worksheet and can connect them and you see then the whole logic in one view. And normally in a DCS, you use only this view. You don't have that um, the other old one, except if you have a PLC underlying, like Siemens. So on the last, of course, uh, now the higher programming, when we have everything ready, we can go through sequence to automate some, uh, some um, actions. Now, this is a step and it do something and then there is a condition and when this condition is fulfilled, then it goes into the next step and do something other. So maybe here it open a valve and then after a while there's time or so then we close or whatever so there's a very simple example for a sequence in a dcs we have to we want to control a whole plant and that means we have to look also to divide the plant into smaller areas. So this is our whole plant. And then we put some areas, upstream, downstream, utilities, whatever, different units, reactors, vessel, and I don't know what else. And create this as a process cell. So process cell means that this, um, it can contain several units. It is more or less um, like, a, yeah, like a mini plant, something like this. A unit maybe is then an, uh, it's a vessel or a reactor. And on a unit, you can have different equipment modules. Each equipment module then do some specific for this unit. So maybe you have an equipment module for the agitator and other equipment module for for temperature control, then for input and output transfer and so on. Depends on pressure control. So that we make then dedicated equipment modules. And the good thing is that we can, uh, if, we, if we modularize this, then we can reuse the code, just copy paste even on a higher level. So it's not only on, 
on the lowest level for the control modules. The control modules, that is the, the lowest level which have the I.O. to the field. So that means the control module here can be an analog input, can be a digital input, a motor control, or so on. So that is um, how our DCS normally physically build an, a plant. And this is then the, the software side. So we have then equipment phases, that means some sequences in an equipment module. They will be controlled from unit phases, which is also nothing else than just sequences. So that unit phase gives different commandos to different equipments, depending on what you want. So let's say a unit phase can handle a, a filling process and start the temperature control and uh, wait, and then do some um, uh, transfer also. A unit operation is again just a higher level which call then unit phases. So that is like the sequence which I have shown short before is just steps and transitions from this level on up to the top. So from unit operation is one is missing in that diagram, there should be a um, unit procedure. So that is in between operation and a procedure. There is a unit procedure that can run only on that unit. And you cannot control from this unit um, procedure any other unit. For that you have to use then the highest level and that is the procedure or our recipe. But you don't must have all. It depends on the complexity of your process. So this in total is what when we talk about recipe that we have this structure and they are based on equipment modules and they use internal control modules to get the, the contact to the field. So that is just a, a run through the both type of PLC and DCS. Up to here, is there anyone who have a question? I don't hear any. So take, I'll not... take that as a no, perhaps. We'll have time for questions at the end anyway, Michael. So maybe at this, this stage we can... Yeah, I, because of, um, I thought it good for this specific Subchapter because the next it starts and with um, I O's, but it's okay. We can do also all later on. So one point is how we can connect the the field, our sensors and actors to our system, whatever that is. Now I talk both um, independent. It is a PLC or DCS. They have both the necessary to connect to a field and both use principally the same techniques. So what you can see here are some typical things you have um, for temperature measuring um, that, is, that need a special um, input card. And uh, we can have a serial connection to bring a multiplexer where we can connect several temperatures at one device and give the uh, information with a serial protocol. Or we get uh, remote I.O. That in principle um, is the, the development from to bring the, the hardware cards which were normally together with the DCS in the switch room down to the field. What does it mean? I will explain later on. So we have also then uh, analog signals on a hard protocol with four to 20 milliamp. That means this can also power up the sensor, the electronic in, in a temperature measurement, pressure, flow, or whatever you have. Then we have a, another um, specific system that is a foundation field bus. 
this runs on a specific bus. It has an own controller and it can do some, some points which, which I will explain later on. Then Profibus, which is in principle similar to the normal remote I.O. And uh, the development was that first they developed um, remote I.O. with the Modbus protocol. Then comes up the Profibus and later on in the I'm not sure, beginning of 2000 or so, or end of the 90s, they came out in the uh, USA with this foundation field bus. So that is more um, very high um, installed in uh, US, where in Europe you have more the Profi bus, and also I think in, in Asia, Profi bus and Modbus. And this is here a newer thing that we can go even wireless. And wireless is very interesting. Um, you should not compare this directly with your home wireless. Of course, the, the technique is the same, but um, this wireless gives us even much more possibilities, which a normal sensor with a cable cannot do. So let's think you, you want to measure the temperature in a rotating reactor or in, in everything what, what rotate. And it's clear that you, you don't have such a long cable that, uh, that you can go on rotating. Um, but you want to get the, the temperature, the pressure inside of this reactor, the rolling reactor. And this wireless instruments have now the possibility, they have a bigger battery, they can hold half year or one year or so about. And then of course you need to change the battery, but still then they can uh, send the signals even over a wider area, so a wider range. And you can mesh the Wi-Fi signal so that each of the sender here can get information from that. So let's say from here is far away that see this post, and they build even a gateway to the main gateway so that this can have a longer distance as well. And we don't have to pull any cable, but it make very interesting. So again, a, a picture from the history. <laughs> that is how cabinets look in former time where we have all the IO connected into a switch room to specific cards. That means you have to bring uh, all the cables from the field into your switch room, which is a huge of cable and copper and very expensive, and even installation costs and so on. So that's why we try to, oh, not me, not me. <laughs> um, they try to bring out better solutions, and that is the, the old way. So let's say you have your your field, you have any sensors, any Is it just me who's lost Michael or, or is everyone lost Michael? Yeah, no, we can't hear. I lost him okay. as well. Okay. Hopefully he'll come back. Give him a text. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what you, you could hear my last sentence, but this is 
the, the old way, very expensive, with this big cable, a lot of copper, and copper becomes also more and more expensive. And therefore, they develop now this remote IOs, which is nothing else as to bring the IO cards, which are normally be here in the switch room, down in the field. So then you have only your short cable, which you connect to a uh, remote cabinet, and then you have a bus system to your to your main system, the PLC or um, DCS. Just uh, by the way, for those people who look for Amazon, um, even with a Modbus driven third party IO cabinet, you can uh, save a lot of money by saving the uh, signal, uh, uh, device signal tech, the DST. And Amazon is based on this DST's the license and everything up what you need later on for other software packages you have to pay according your DST account in your field. And you can reduce that this uh, this a third party Modbus remote cabinet. This is just an, a hide for insider. So going forward, um, we have this tree in principle, this tree bus system in uh, in our plant. There are some more, but they are not so important. So these are really the three main and standard buses, which are used to in principle to do this connection from your field to your main system. So let us go through them all. Modbus was what I told the very early one, but it is a very simple software protocol, very stable, and of course the oldest what we have, and it's, uh, it was developed by um, Gold Modicon, and is still in use up to today. So many utility machines also also provide uh, Modbus connection. Of course, they have also some Profibus connection. That is depends on what you order. So you can get both. And uh, the software configuration, you have to it, um, maybe if you think at a board where you have different um, boxes, then each box is one register. So you put in your information from one side and get it out on the other side on request of the, the main system. The Profibus is a bit more, um, yeah, it, it was developed from Siemens mainly uh, to connect their own PLCs so that they can have a communication over the PLCs and this could build also a, a small, like a small DCS. But it is a bit more complicated to configure, but it is also simple. So, I mean, I have done this very often. I have done Modbus, I have done uh, Profibus, and um, they are very simple to, to configure and to get it running. Both are strict master-slave devices. That means the main system just send a command on a serial table on the bus and ask a device with a specific address what it want to get. And then this master listen on the answer from the slave device. So that's what we want to get the information from. And in between, there is no communication. It is not like an, uh, like an Ethernet where everybody just can send what, what and whenever it wants. It is a strict, clear hierarchy who have to send when, which, uh, which data. Foundation field bus is a bit more complicated because um, that they, they brought in a new idea also, especially 
for the petrochemical industry, the pipelines and so on, where they have maybe some some pump stations or any valve or somewhere somewhere in the desert. I don't know where they have the pipes running, and they they need to bring also power. Not only we don't want to get only the data, we have to support also our devices with power. And that is the new concept here, that we bring the power on the same wire with the data. So there's some, some electronic to, to separate this later, but on the other hand, um, it produces some more problems, let's say like this. And of course, that is also limited. And uh, a foundation field bus is built up by own uh, segments, uh, segments. And these devices are, in principle, mini controllers. So they have some really rudimentary function blocks so that you, they can make an, um, a loop control with the sensor device and the actor device. And you can have a PID controller or function block in the um, sensor or in the actor. You can program this. So they, they provide some basic functionalities in every sensor or actor. And they can communicate to each other without to ask the DCS. The DCS just give command and read the, the data. It do nothing more. So it gives a set point, but it do not calculate maybe the output of a control valve. This can be done on the devices themselves. That is fine if you do control in the field, yeah, um, where they can, can be more independent from a control system. So let's say if a cable break, they still can hold the last set point and work. They will not go off or so, then they just let it. Or if there are some communication problem on whatever reason. But you have to take care much more than with the other both bus systems because of how long your cable is, how less you can power up devices at the end because every cable has some resistance and at the end, you will not have enough power to, to um, power up, let's say, 10 devices. You can do on a long cable, maybe only two or three. Um, this is one point, but you have to look also uh, on the software side, on the bus cycle time. So that means how often we can exchange the data. And that is also, it's, if you just think like a cake, then you have maybe one second, so that is a, a, the time from the cake. And every device needs some time to execute itself to get the information from the physical sensor and prepare for the bus. And it needs also time to, um, yeah, to send the data on the bus so that everybody can read it. And if you don't take care for this bus cycle time, then you automatically get slowly a process response. And if that is not enough, um, normally I have seen that, unfortunately, <laughs> also in projects in Amazon where our hardware department did not work so tight in the beginning, together with the software department. They just went through the normal standard engineering, looked for the, um, for the field devices and the bus segments, and then checked the power supply, and that was all fine. And then came we from the software side and say, no, we cannot have these devices on that bus segment. We have to change some. They take too long time, or there are several reason where well, it do not match always. And of course, then there's a big uh, trouble always when if the hardware department is already ready, they don't want to change, but there's no way. So if you don't coordinate very well, 
this engineering for foundation field paths, you will have a lot of problem later. And that is one of the biggest disadvantage in my eyes. And um, I, additional, I also don't know really why foundation field paths is used so often, especially in, in compact plants like uh, a pharmacy, like uh, any chemical plant. So uh, the concept with the remote cabinets is much better, much easier to handle than this uh, foundation field bus. So I'm not really a friend from foundation field bus and even all the devices and everything else are much more expensive than the other ones. They say, yeah, you can save engineering time, which is not really true. Uh, what I told before, that you don't work together good enough. And even in the loop check and commissioning time, that should be so easy, but it isn't also as well. So I have done, I think, four or five projects with Foundation Field Bus and the commissioning for, so means loop check to test all single instrument. It takes the same time to test it. It does not really save something. So don't believe really the, the seller, that is not true. That's my experience and not only my, everybody who have to do this can tell about it. So, if you, it does not mean that the foundation of Philippines is a bad bus, but you should look where you use that. So, Let's say in decentralized systems like pipelines or where things are very far, then it might be good to have foundation field bus, but you can do everything also with the other bus, with Modbus and uh, Profibus connection. Even Modbus can have, there are two different one, Modbus um, RTU, and that means a serial like Profibus, but we have also Modbus over Ethernet. And then we, uh, but we use then the specific Ethernet devices to extend a longer cable. So here, Modbus and Profibus, you talk about maximum cable length of roughly one kilometer. And that should be long enough for every plant, for every normal plant in a building. So there is no reason to, to go for foundation field bus because of uh, uh, cable length or whatever. So you have to look, what is your process? What are your, your physical conditions? And then you, you can choose the, the best bus, or maybe you have a mix also, it can be. So the DCS just put in a different uh, IO card and then you can have a Modbus, a Profi bus or a foundation field bus on the same DCS. But again, I, I would recommend for normal inbuilt plans, not to use foundation field bus. Up to now, nobody really could convince me why that is much better than all the other ones. And I have some experience already with uh, 25 years plus. <laughs> okay, here were my next stop for questions, especially because here the first chapter end about PLC DCS and IO field bus. The next would be then HMI. Is there any question in a moment or you want to hold them all until the end? So I don't hear any. Then, okay, I'd, then say I you can, I'd say you can drive on, Michael. Yeah, then I go first. Huh? So a totally new chapter, high performance HMI, so human machine interface, alarms and safety interlock. What does that mean? We know, meanwhile, okay, we have our DCS and the DCS have monitors and the people sit the whole day. So normally a shift eight or some even 12 hours on a shift at such monitors and they have to control a process. And um, the main purpose is that the, the graphic displays shall give the, um, the operator the right information, what is happening in the process. So what is the temperature, the level of this, the pressure there, and is there maybe any 
alarm or something abnormal in the process. Normally, if everything runs well, I have seen that that operator then, especially on night shift, they have the feet up on the table and just look. <laughs> uh, it should not be like this, but they do. Um, but the, the HMI also gives the operator some possibilities to control the system. So they can do by mouse click, open a valve, start a pump. Depends on whatever you, uh, you need in your process. But an HMI should not be an art. And that maybe you don't realize, but I came from a time when even control displays were built with, uh, with text characters. So especially Emerson or the former is the Fisher Control Provox system, which now also belong to Emerson. That is uh, more or less a, a set of text characters or parts of, of graphical symbols. And it's not to compare like we have now with, um, with our real graphics. And when it came with even with Windows, so in the uh, mid of 90 or early 2000, this uh, HMI become then more free. So we could really create graphics as, I don't know, whatever. And the freedom to make these graphics and mostly in very funny graphics like a 3D art. So the vessel was 3D, a pump was really, it looks like a pump, like a picture of a pump in that process graphic. And I will give you some examples now. And um, this is, uh, this is not really uh, 3D, maybe I should change the order. That one here, you see what I mean? It, it built up everything, how it looks in the field. But when you compare this graphic, what does it tell you to have a symbol for a pump like this, or that it looks like a valve, or I don't know what else you have here. So if you check here, or here, or maybe here, you see, it is all like 3D because we could do, but nobody thought about the operator. And um, yeah, normally I would like to interact here with the uh, auditorium here because high performance HMI and alarms means you should give me some answers what you can see here. So let's say I just ask, do you see any abnormal situation in this graphic? It's very difficult to, to identify because there are so many colors, so many red and green and yellow and nobody know really. And even uh, the devices have colors and even different ones. So this one is a different color than here. Does it have a meaning, this coloring or? Nobody know really. So that means it looks more like the, that the graphic designer become an, an art um, and, uh, or make art graphics. Yeah. And the, the change happened in some years later where people saw this is not really efficient, this kind of graphics, because they are overloaded and people don't get the right information at the right time. So for example, also here, this pump have a color and another color when it runs or not, or this one, the valve here, this is red, this is orange, this is green. So nobody know really what is the meaning of that. And if you think for colorblind people and many men, uh, are colorblind or a kind of colorblind, so they cannot differentiate between this green and that red, or is it blue? I don't know. For me, it is red. <laughs> um, also, this one, this pumps here, 
And the numbers, they, are, uh, they look very modern in digital signs, seven segment displays. And uh, but what does it tell? Is it pressure? Is it speed? Is it, no? there's no, no unit behind and is it in normal range? We don't see really, is there any wrong in that part of display? And now I will show you the same display in a high performance HMI style. And that looks like this. So when you see, first of all, you see everything is a bit flat, gray in gray. And it should be like this. Because of in everything, if everything is normal, we should not get attracted by a very nice 3D vessel or something like that, or I don't know what else for funny colors. We should get aware about any abnormal directly. Even if you look from a more from a longer distance, you can see on this graphic that here is something wrong, and here is something wrong, and the rest is okay. But what I told you also with these numbers, you have of course you need a, a real absolute number, but with this bar graph. You can see, okay, we are in the normal range, which is a bit low, but it's still okay. Well, this start to go out from the normal range, or this one is out from the normal range. So there's something, something wrong or uh, whatever. And here you see a small yellow field and a red. That means you have an alarm. So there, there is, there is no flow. So there's something wrong whatever there is wrong, but here is an alarm. So you have to do something. Also with this radar plot, um, the, they have more symbols in high performance in HMI, like this radar plots, or even uh, for a cologne, or um, that if everything is good, the circle, what you see here, all the points should be connected so that it have a, a good shape. If that is totally deform, deformed, then there's something wrong. Or let's say for another example, you have a cologne and you have many temperatures and then you have your, your um, bar graphs horizontal. Um, if you set the right uh, range, then you can see if everything is just straight in one line, then everything is okay. But if it's one temperature is out of range, then you see directly some, some curves or so, and that should not be. So you don't need to know the absolute number, but you see directly something is wrong. That is not okay. Yeah, or here for the, the trend, how often your, um, your level is out of the range. So this, the blue, it's also the normal range, but this is overloaded. This is still okay, sometimes empty, but maybe that have also a normal process reason, can be. So this, uh, this and even a less um, PID oriented process graphic. So this is more an overview graphic over the, the, the main, um, sensors of your plant or of your process, especially this is uh, for for a reactor. So you have some pressures, you have some some flow rates, temperatures, and you see everything is still in range. So this trend here is all the time in the blue area. So that it move to left. And then you see here always the latest value. And this is from the history from the last one hour, two hour, whatever you set here. But you can see everything is okay. And that is what we mean with high performance HMI. And it shows also, especially this, the, the radar plot and some, even some other symbols um, that you can get much better and much, yeah, even more safe 
information out from the from this display. You see here there is an alarm. While everything else is more or less gray and gray, we have an alarm here and we have an alarm here. And for the people who are colorblind, they have also uh, a shape, this tree angel. There exists another shape like this square or even a, a ball, a circle. And they are all dedicated for a specific priority. So you have always, if that is priority four, you have always a square on, like this. If it is a priority two, we have a tree angel. So it doesn't matter, even if you can see only black and white, you can see the priority of this alarm by the number and by the shape. So that is the, the, main, um, the main point in high performance HMI. Some other tell there is some um, yeah there's a discussion in the meaning of what you see here white and gray. So actually in that view it should show that white means it is on or active or or a valve it is open. Because of uh, someone explained me that one time, I have I I had to do this HMI uh, interface. High performance action I for Emerson uh, at BASF plant in Germany. That was my one of my last biggest project in Germany. And I had some discussions with uh, the people who required this ones, and then we discussed how we should handle the uh, the color for the motor or for a valve. Normally or mostly we have done this with red and green, but we don't want to have colors, so we have to go in gray or let's say gray and white. But um, the, the developer of this high performance, they, they uh, um, point that everything what is light or is bright or just white is like a lamp. So if you switch on a lamp, it is light. If you switch off, it is dark. That is by their meaning. But the other people, and I also like to follow this way is, if that is gray, that means if that have the same color like the pipe, that means there is it, everything can go through. And if that is white, there is an interruption. So that means there is no connection from here to here. So there is a philosophy which is not clear, but by definition you can set in your project what is the meaning of white and gray. And then you should keep it, of course, over all your, your systems in your plant if you have Several ones. Um, to, to explain more details about this, I plan to do an, a separate lecture just for high performance HMI to, to explain more and even show more symbols and more examples how you can do this in your process. But for today, I want to just want to give you some ideas that even if your DCS manufacturer is a bit lazy to create very complex graphics, um, you, you should know that there is a lot more possible as you mostly get in the beginning of a project. But of course, you have to develop together with the manufacturer what you want. But if you don't know what is possible, you don't know what you can get. So that's um, quite easy. And everybody wants to reduce his own work. And therefore, maybe you don't see what is possible in the DCS for what you pay. You get a Mercedes and you use it only to, to go to the bakery to buy some bread or so. Okay, so the next point, sub point is uh, alarms and trips. And uh, that is something where many people also don't think about. They just take the, the standard alarm concept, what we have done all the time, so we have done ever, so why we should change. It means we have a pre-alarm, we have a trip. And both generate an alarm. So in the former graphic, you have seen some yellow and some red. And um, nobody asked, what does this alarm tell you? For what is it really good? So first of all, you have to look what 
the operator can do with this alarm. So if there is something colored, yeah, okay, then there is an alarm. But maybe it's not so important. It's just a warning. You don't need to take care about this. You maybe can tell the maintenance later and say, well, look, there's some, maybe at the motor, the pump have to less flow rate or something like that. Yeah, but it's not really important in the moment. Um, that is the normal point of view, what I have seen many times. And with this information, we have to ask what the operator should do. So we have two possibilities. He's allowed to do something, a manual operating in a process means you see, oh, the, the flow rate is too low. Then you can go and overwrite the normal sequences and set maybe a controller to a different set point or do something from the system open here or there um, that the operator normally, especially in continuous running plans, so not the, like a pharmacy where we have always batch, so that means we start, then it runs uh, whatever time, and then it stop and finish. The continuous plan maybe can run five years without stop, and it should do like this. And every abnormal situation, because the sensor can become bad, a valve maybe start leaking and so on, many of that things can happen during a longer time of operating. So the question then is what the operator is allowed to do with abnormal situations. Is he allowed to do some manual operating that he can handle this to avoid a shutdown? Very easy. So we should go go on for production because uh, maybe the, the shutdown and start up can take a long time and you lose a lot of time and of course time is money is everywhere the same or you have such a good automated system and tell the operator is this allowed to do any manipulating on whatever reason maybe there are some regulation or reason or quality uh, which uh, disallow to do something, but I can tell you that everything what an operator does through the DCS is recorded. If you don't give them some possibilities, they want to do some, and then they go in the field and then they manipulate a hand valve. So we don't have any any connection to the DCS with a hand valve. A hand valve normally should be open or closed, but it should not be used for normal operating. But I have seen many times that it happened that the operator just go shift by shift and just turn at the hand valve. So I, I tuned a temperature control on a vessel and it was really a very complicated and um, yeah, difficult to tune temperature control. And every day it was something different. And so there was the same product, the same the condition from the process, everything was nice, but the temperature control worked different and nobody really could explain why. And then after a while we found out that the hand valves were changed. And we could see then after a while it happened on one shift always. So that was then the point where we really had to go to management and tell, hey, the operator play with the hand valves and disturb our tuning and even bring maybe the system in a unstable condition. So that should be then really highlighted and uh, the operator should be trained that they don't have to touch the hand valves during normal process. Yeah. It does not mean if they can do something from the system that they would not do also uh, use the, the hand valve, but they will, because for the hand valve, they have to go out in the process, in the field, and if they can do some from the system, they would do for the system from their chair. So, but we have to take care what really an operator have for chances to do something in abnormal situation. So let us look first, he is allowed to do some, and here are some points, which then become important for him. If he can do something on an alarm, so what 
which alarm would be more important, the pre-alarm or the trip alarm? Uh, here again, I would like to, to hear some answers from you, but uh, everybody is quiet. Um, okay, the trip alarm means you had already shut down. So there's nothing much to do also uh, without, or except maybe to clean, to do something, whatever. The pre-alarm in that case is much more important because of on a pre-alarm, the operator can still act and do something. While on a trip alarm, when the, the, the process already tripped, yeah, then there's nothing, it's shut down, stop. It's already too late to do. So from that point of view, the pre-alarm should have a much higher priority than the trip alarm. Because on the pre-alarm, you can do and you should get this information as fast as possible. So that should be more a critical alarm than a trip alarm. If you trip, <clears throat> if you trip then you trip, you will see that the plant stands still, it stands still. That don't must have an, a critical alarm just to show him, okay, the plant have shut down now. He see on his own, you don't need the alarm. Another question is, how many alarms can an operator handle let's say in one hour. So the normal thumb rule is not more than five per hour. You need time to handle each alarm one by one and do something to avoid the shutdown. Even if you call someone in the field and that he should look and do whatever is broken, but he, he have to have the time to avoid a trip. And the other is, what does a good HMI can help? So let's say you have a continuous plant and that runs for three years. Then meanwhile, also the stuff change, you get new um, employee and yeah, they, they learn how to do this and that and that, but they have never seen maybe one specific alarm. So they don't know, oh, there's an alarm, I, I don't know what is to do now. The HMI can give you an alarm help description. So at least I know from Amazon, in a, there's a button for the, in the face plates. And then you can set some instructions, what is to do if this alarm appear. So that means the HMI can give you a good help to react on that alarm. Then, um, what else can we do maybe from the software side? So we can, um, we can do also some actions when we get an alarm or when we run into an, or if, before we run into an alarm, we can have some specific code and activate this to avoid the abnormal situation. And um, the last one is if the operator said something to manually, then that means this part of system is not really under control. So it is, it depends on the operator. Now the operator said something manual and then he have to go to the toilet. It's a long time already from the last time. So he let it and don't tell the, maybe his colleague what he have done. So, and the DCS and especially the safety system, that means safety interlock here, have always priority over everything what an operator do. So the safety system then bring your process always in a safe um, state that nothing can happen, especially no explosion or fire or what, <clears throat> what else, or even just a machine can be damaged when the pump dry, the wrong dry, something like that. So, can we, we come now to the point, the operator is disallowed to do any. So, he just should let run sequences and the automation system do everything automatically. On, again, whatever reason, but it is like it is. The operator have limited things to do. Maybe you have to answer a prompt or something like that. Have you connected this 
tube or blah, 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 whatever. That is the job then in a system where he is disallowed to operate also. So for what, that is my question and I, I would like to hear again from you some answers. But what do we need so many alarms or even pre-alarms? Because you cannot do any. It's not allowed. You can just look, oh, there's an alarm, there comes another alarm, oh, there's a new alarm, fine. So that means uh, in, in half an hour, I have a big problem. But you cannot go and avoid the problem because it's not allowed to do any. So then I have to ask for what we need all these alarms. So many alarms, even high and low alarm, and I don't know what. This, okay, um, yeah, the auditorium is very quiet. Otherwise, I, I would build up some of your ideas, what you can do. So that means. Um, uh, Michael, if I could maybe suggest, we're, we're kind of gone past 10 to 8. So maybe if, if, the, if the kind of talk will say has, has come to the end of the bulk of the slides, maybe we could start into the the kind of the Q&A if there's one or two uh, or three yeah, questions. Yeah, it's, Would that um, be an idea? I'm not sure if you're at the end of your slides or if you need a minute to wrap up. If you do, that's, that's fine. We're, we're scheduled yeah, to finish okay. at eight, so we'll try and kind of keep to that timeline as much as possible. Yeah, that uh, I thought maybe I, I will use too much time for all. Yeah, okay, let me just finish that part with the alarms. Um, just some ideas. So disable alarms for unused equipment. So why we should have a flow low alarm on the pump, which is off, for example. Um, the other is um, alarm flood. So let's say you have a pressure, a flow, or some other alarms, and your pump have a problem. So then you trip maybe on, on a flow, but or on a pressure, but then your, your flow alarm also will appear. But this is only a following alarm. It is not important to see that alarm because if you know the pump is stopped, the flow is, it doesn't matter. So you don't need an alarm for that. You see it, your pressure was too high. That's why it tripped. Then spend the better diagnostic on your devices. Many devices can deliver a lot of diagnostic values and uh, so they, they can tell you that they need some maintenance or so. The other is distribute the alarms. Let it not do all by the operator. So some alarms are more interesting for maintenance, other for the operator for the process. Okay. And then use smart interlock to reduce. That is what, what I mean uh, if the DCS should support also in the backhand. Smart interlock could be maybe that it reduce the flow rate before it shut off a valve. So if if you if you have a specific flow rate and let's say there is a reaction and if you go on with the same flow rate, then your reaction will run out of control. But if you can reduce the flow rate for a while, then maybe this uh, reaction stabilize and come back to a normal situation. Then you can slowly go up with your flow rate again. That is what a, a DCS system can do for you. So then, um, yeah, that would be the last question, but maybe that we can, I'm not sure this, uh, because of the time is already gone, shall we go through that one or shall we skip it and maybe do another lecture or something like that? I'd, I'd say for tonight, to be honest with you, we've, we've already kind of been talking for an hour and a half. So I'd probably maybe, uh, if you can do it very, very briefly, maybe in a minute or two. Yeah, okay, I try. This is not much, this is very short. Um, as you see, uh, everybody who do project or is um, responsible for projects, uh, now the discrepancy between project and commissioning, so I put this as one group, and operating and maintenance. They are like cat and dog. They don't like each other because of the project team have just a limited budget and limited time, and then they have to bring the project through the door. Operation team, 
want to have the best what you can get on the market, but of course for price for a cheap proton. You know, proton is a car from Malaysia. Um, what does the project team then do? The project team do very simple. They just buy the cheapest equipment, what they can use for, and they don't mind how long it holds. So it is not true for every, so I have to I, I, um, over describe it a bit. But in principle, I have seen very often like that. And they don't mind if, if a pump maybe is not really suitable for that, but it's still run and for the moment is okay. But they know in half a year or one year, the pump will break. So operating have to exchange the pump. If you would buy directly a bit better pump, then you can reduce the cost because of you have to spend some money in the beginning, but later on you will not have a trip and you have a plan shut down because your pump is broken. Some other is um, <laughs> press software guys to do magic on wrong ordered equipment, especially valves. I got very often the request to do a control on a control valve where I got the maximum flow after 10% opening. So that means this valve was much too big. There is no way really to, to control something. And then they come to software, to the automation guys and, and ask uh, why your control don't work for me. And that is something they don't want to change the valve in the project, but then they, they shift the, the thing to the software or later on operating or maintenance have to change this valve to a better one. It can be that maybe you have a specific valve and uh, it takes a long time to order that some exceptions. But I have seen many times that the, operation, uh, the project team was not willing to change valves. And yeah, I think it is not good to think like that. Then in software also, you normally have a software design and want to follow that structure so that everybody can find out how it works very easy. But sometimes you have some exceptions and then start the, the hour for all the experts and then they start to program something. That guy go more this style and add something. The, other, the next one go and have for the same problem other solutions. So you can get two or three different solutions which are not from the, um, according to the original one, but when you want to maintenance this, then you get really a, a big problem later on. And um, this is also some, yeah, I have seen that as well, that people then told the operation don't need now. They can buy it themselves later. So this, we can take it out from our project part. So just let it reduce the cost, everything is, Fine for project team, then the project uh, team disappear from the plant and let the operating and maintenance still with all the, the things what they have done wrong. So that would be also now some uh, questionnaire that you should give also some ideas, but that means now. Uh, we come to the questions anyway, and this is also the end of my lecture here in a moment. So then from now, uh, hey, really thank you. Time. Thank you, uh, Michael, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, we'll have some questions now for anyone who has questions. Uh, perhaps I might get the, the ball rolling myself while you're all thinking about your questions. Um, I have one, Michael, for you. Um, I know you spoke about kind of the different alarms in terms of, I suppose, the next step in how we can improve, uh, I suppose, interlocking systems in particular. But I suppose from a more graphical HMI point of view, what you took us through uh, the different, I suppose, what came through is the use of color to better highlight alarms in the kind of the first generation of improvements, kind of going forward into the future in terms of the visual graphical improvements in the kind of H HMI experience, what do you kind of see as kind of the next generation of, of making the, the system work more 
kind of perform more, more effectively in terms of getting that information across kind of from a, a graphical point of view? Yeah, that is what I what I told that we uh, have then specific symbols like this, the shapes, the tree angel is a number in and uh, that, that should be used always for the same priority. So you cannot have a critical alarm with a tri angel and then the warning with a tri angel. The tri angel gives you the same information as in the old style with red and yellow, where red is maybe critical and yellow is uh, <coughs> a warning. So these shapes, the symbols, that give you an additional information. If you are colorblind, or even if you just see black and white. So you have to look from this kind of view. Um, you maybe also don't sit always one meter in front of your monitor. When you are in a control room, you see often the people go and run around, and, um, but they still look on their monitors, but from, from a far distance. And when I see some, some symbols, and even in this gray and gray shame, the flat shame, some color that can attract their attention much better than if your display is colorful anyway. So you don't see an alarm in a colorful display. That's what I showed in the beginning, the old style of displays. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, anyone else with a question? Yeah, uh, my name is Prasad Michael. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for a very interesting presentation. You you kind of took us through the history and some of us were old enough, we remember some of what you said. And, uh, and very interesting. So I, I'm not in, I'm in manufacturing. I used to be the site leader for Pfizer until last year. So I, I used to have automation in my team in earlier lives. One of the uh, one of the biggest challenges we are finding now is, you probably heard through it, is data integrity and lack of trust from the regulators. I've even had a recent audit where the regulator wanted to print screens from Delta V and sign them off. It's actually moving us backward in history, you know, to from uh, paper to electronic to back to paper. Uh, unfortunately, that's the industry we are in. But let's hope that these things will be overcome in the future. Um, uh, one of the real, uh, the alarm management is really a good point. I uh, you know we've run a lot of Six Sigma projects at the site to eliminate nuisance alarms and bring it down to a manageable few. Uh, I totally agree with the colors and the attention grabbers that you mentioned. Uh, the data analytic capability is coming to be a big thing. You know, as we try to emulate what we call as the golden batch, you know, so we, so proactively looking at in which direction the process is moving, how are the CPPs being uh, managed, what impact would they have on the KQAs, you know, uh, quality attributes. So, so what, what do you think uh, the future is for data analytics, you know, in uh, in uh, in in this year, or even PLCs? Yeah, for data analytics, that means you have to pull out the data from your system. Yes, in real time, in real time, yeah. We used to do that retrospectively in the past by dumping to spreadsheets and doing statistics on it. The expectation now is uh, real-time visualization and analytic capability. Yeah. You are um, from Pfizer Singapore? Yes, yes. Yeah, because I also worked a little bit for, for you. <laughs> Okay. But, uh, some years ago. Um, from that, I, I know a bit what you talk about. I heard that when they start to discuss about this. But um, of course, the way is that you, you need your specific analytic programs that is not part of the DCS anymore. The DCS can provide only the data, and then that it, what else should the DCS do? It is not an analytic program, uh, so it is not an that this is a control system, it's not an analytical system. Yes. There's no way you have to pull out the data and use the specific program which can do this much better. And especially with Delta V, that is very easy to get the data. So you, you use anyway Pi, I think. And the yes, we use OSI Pi, yeah. Uh, I was more thinking about the factory of the future where, I mean, you look at this current generation of uh, graduates 
they've all grown up on playing video games, you know. They find the the classical Delta V, even the look, everything quite boring, you know. You know, if they have to do so. Uh, so really, I was thinking, how much of the technology can be put behind the scenes? You know, like when you when you operate a you know MacBook or a PC, you don't see most of the technology. You see very little interface. You know. And, and, and uh, do you foresee, because DCS by far are very expensive to, to build, very much customized, very difficult to change easily, and not, uh, not everybody understands how they work, even in a manufacturing plant. You know? hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but um, this uh, high performance HMI can help yeah. you at least during that, that moment. So it will support you for, for the moment. The only thing what uh, you can see from the history are your trends. So that you have to, you have to analyze on the normal way. But the main thing is what the system can do for the moment for you and your process. So you don't want to stop production. And that means your, your system where you, what you told, you, you paid a lot of money but that can support you in many ways for the actual problem. You can start even some uh, support sequences or whatever for abnormal situations so that you go a step aside and do something different than normally just to catch the process back to normal. And um, also if there is what I told, especially with Delta V, this alarm help, I'm not sure you use that, I cannot remember that you click on and get a text which you can self um, edit as a customer and you don't need to program this. You, you can open this one and then uh, with the right access, you can just type in what the operator have to do in this in this moment. And I think that is something but the system can help you, but to analyze that is something what you need to do later on when something happened and you want to know why. So then the system should give you at least, of course, all the data. It should tell you what was the reason, so what was the first alarm and all of this, but you, you get it from your log events. So you can trace that. But to, to have a better analyzing that you need your external programs. That I think no other way. Okay, so thanks, Michael. So you don't see the the traditional players going into that space, you know, be it Amazon or ABB or anybody, Siemens. Um, yeah, yeah. So let's say for for devices, for valves or something like that, or even motors and, and stuff like this, the devices become more and more smart. So they mm -hmm. they have a lot of information in uh, inside, which we can get out and. Um, it is not that the valve just open and close and get some, some position where it should go. Uh, it tell you, okay, I, I need this and this time, or um, I, I cannot reach the end position correct. So you, you give zero percent, but the valve block somewhere. And that the valve can measure this and can give you an, even an alarm that something is wrong, that it is locked, maybe you know, some scratches or so disallow to, to move correct. Um, these are things well, which are already in Delta V, so you can use this. Um, for, for process abnormalities, I don't know how a system should support you for the analyzing. It can only supply the data, what you told, and you, you already have them out from the system. And that's it. Then you have to go through the data with whatever program you have. You yeah, see we, that really yeah, we, uh, we have system. used uh, artificial intelligence linked with uh, smart sensors, like you said, the information from the valve and the process parameters to build the machine learning modules, you know, but in a very small way, just for a dryer. Yeah. Yeah. But this is so the, the diagnostic capability that they are. Um, very big, but they are also all just for the moment. 
So all mm -hmm. maybe from the history a little bit. You know? But um, for uh, process abnormalities, which happen mainly on uh, sensor failures or even valve failures, um, uh, you can get out this information with uh, the right diagnostic tools. You can set alarms if the instrument is out of the range, so not from the measuring, but uh, does it, that it do not work correct. And that is what, um, what is already inbuilt in the system. So that is still there. I'm not sure you use this, the device alarms and so on. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, who's next? Anyone else with a question? Just speak up. Um, Michael, you know the way you, uh, I'm obviously, as you know, from a CNQ background, as a matter of interest, with the different groups that you would work with on a typical uh, project, uh, you would maybe work with people from production, you'd work with a CNQ team, you'd work with a quality team. Uh, is there anything in particular about automation that any of, on, on the typical project that you would work with, any or all of those groups that, that you wish they knew or understood better that would make kind of projects work more smoothly. Do, do you understand my question? Yeah. Um, it, it would help if uh, everybody have some, uh, some basic knowledge how the system works. Uh, they don't need to program as a DCS system. That is just my job or our job. But they, they should at least understand what we can do in a DCS and why we do this in that way. So then they can estimate better, especially quality. Um, <laughs> when you write some testing procedures or so, you know. <laughs> without, without mentioning anyone in particular. Uh, yeah, that, that is, there's always a discussion why and what, what does this testing uh, means and uh, do it really test that what we want to test. So and that if you have guys which have um, at least a little bit information about the DCS, then they can estimate for themselves better. So that is what I did um, mostly when I wrote some test cases the ladies or whoever was responsible for that came to me and asked, what is that meaning? And then I explained them, I showed at the system what we do and where is the part of software, what we test and why it does not have an impact to us or maybe it have an impact and why it have the impact. So I explained as, as easy as I can do that everybody can understand and that is the uh, what I would expect that every automation guy would do if someone come to him and ask for. So everybody should be able to do this. And the other is, um, I have good experience with some project where the operation also was involved very early in the project team. So at least uh, for, yeah, especially for the graphic design and um, yeah, also for some functionalities. So because they, the, the operator know what they want. They understand good. Um, and they can give some background also to the programmer to do something in this and that way, which is better. I have to yeah. check my display. Display become dark. Okay, yes. Have some time. Yeah. Let's see. Thank, thank you, Michael. So better, I suppose, um, input from the, the operations, the final users as early as possible is, is always a good thing. And I suppose that's kind of what you're saying, isn't it? Um, yeah. Anyone for a final question, folks, before we wrap up today? Anyone for a final question? Going once, going twice. 
Okay. Uh, listen, uh, on, on behalf of, of ISPE Singapore, uh, thank you very much, Michael, for a very informative um, Technical Tuesday, our third, third time's a charm. And thanks yeah. very much. And uh, we hope to see you back with us again. And yeah. thanks everyone for uh, dialing in tonight. And uh, we'll see you all at our next Technical Tuesday, which is the last Tuesday of this month. I cannot remember exactly what date it is something around the 28th, perhaps. And uh, we have Chu Wee uh, talking about process analytical technology. So PAT technology, uh, a very good, uh, a very good uh, talk that he'll have for us. So uh, dial in for that at the end of June. Okay, thank you everyone. All bye right, bye. thank you all. Okay. Bye, -bye. Bye. bye bye. Thank you, bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>